welcome to uh, I almost said Barbell Logic. I haven't been on that show in a long time. <laughs> welcome <laughs> to go online. Start. Oh no, no, wait. <laughs> Hold on, where are we? <laughs> yeah, hey, welcome to Growing Resilience Podcast. I'm Scott Hamburg, and that over there is Uncle Todd Dwyer, UTD Uncle Todd Dwyer, and I think this is episode 45. I have been spending on Six? Uh, digital stuff. It's 46. I'll buy that. Might be. I'll buy that. You know, another thing before you go any further, mm. happy anniversary, Scott Hambrick. We've been doing this show now for over a year. It was actually May 2nd, 22, no when we started. Wow. I know. Yeah. Believe that. Yeah. Hey, it's been a pleasure. That's crazy. No, it, it is 45, dude. Yeah, it's, it has. 45. Is it? Okay. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, it's been fun, man. Time flies. Yeah. Uh, um, if somebody had asked, yeah. I would have said it was it has been really fun. seven or eight months. Like not even long enough for you and I to have mm-hmm. a baby together yet. Nope. Yeah, man. Check out my new lights. Look, looky how, looky how. I got my. Uh, I can control Let's them. I can control them from my uh, computer. Ooh. I can get really like. Oh, looky here. Hmm. Hmm. Do you have mood like? Oh, that's no. Oh, mm-hmm. Left, right, mm-hmm. or right, left. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, oh, let's see. Oh, maybe I want this one to be uh, like. I can do bright white. Hmm. 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 Or I can. Which is your better side, your left or your right side? I don't have a good side. They're all old. Um. Um. One thing. One thing I've noticed about this, uh, since I've got this, you know, better camera and better light, uh, is how asymmetrical my face is. I look like I made out of clay, and somebody dropped me. I think this. I had no idea your eyes were so pink. Have you always had pink eyes? Have you, you, you know, you, I had no pink idea eyes. you were an albino. Yeah. yeah. That white hair and pink eyes, that was surprising. I had noticed that before with the poor lighting. Yeah, I think huh. th- this eye is starting to migrate to the side of my head like a flounder. Oh, that's unusual for it to happen that late in life. Usually happens when you're young. Yeah, yeah I think that um, <laughs> it's significant. I think I may be getting ready to uh, go on a mating trip. Oh. Well, I wish you the very best. Yeah. Lucky for uh, you, there's a female flounder that lives in your same uh, in your same home. I'm like Spock. I'm going to return to my home planet. And uh, <laughs> and then what? Do battle <laughs> for like a, a severe, oh. humorless old woman. <laughs> a worthy cause. <laughs> yeah. So this is episode 45 and, um, we were going to talk about some things. Um, mm-hmm. I've already started harvesting, harvesting some stuff and putting things back. Wow. As it were. Let's see. Oh, look, look there's my wife right there. Look at there, right there. Oh, there she is sitting yeah. out in a, with a beautiful sunset in the background. That's really nice. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, I've been harvesting greens and, uh, blanching those and freezing them and putting them away. Um, I'm almost ready to turn over a bed. What? I'm almost I'm almost ready to turn around all my 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 collards and um I'm I'll be doing it here in the next few days. I'm gonna call, turn them over and put collards in. Yep, it's gonna happen. Wait, you're turning over call you're putting collards in. You're turning over a collard bed and putting in more collards. Turning them over, turning them in, and I'll put uh, okra in. Oh, got it. Get it. so the collard. So if you're cutting leaves off collards down in zone seven or six. Yep. Uh, do they have a pretty short season down there and they just begin to bolt because it's just simply too warm? It's too warm. I've already had a few bolt and it's coming. Oh, uh, We've got a, a, a new lease on Caldered Life this week. It's, it's cool and kind of overcast. So that's fine, but it could very easily have been 10 or 20 degrees warmer and all of them bolt, you know, so, uh, but, but, right. you know, normally you can, you can cut them back and they'll come back mm-hmm. and you'll be fine, but it's, okay. it's bolting time. It's, it's Yahtzee. It's over. <laughs> you can't pick leaves off them like you could uh kale, for instance, and then maintain them for a couple of months by just picking leaves. If the heat was okay, you could, but that's, when, that's, but it's, it's Oklahoma. It's not gonna happen. Hmm. All right. Did the name change recently? Oklahoma? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Darn. 
I'm really disappointed. Yeah. So I, uh, you know, I, I, I took some, uh, I took some feed sacks down to the garden and, mm -hmm. and, uh, we cut greens and stuff them in a sack and, uh, carry them up to the house. And, um, a 50, a 50 pound feed sack stuffed completely full of collard greens, uh, will let me put about three quarts in the, uh, in the freezer. <laughs> Uh, darn <laughs> but you know three quarts in the freezer so you're talking yeah blanched and frozen that's right that's right uh, clean okay. them all clean them all up and um uh, clean them all up i don't cut the stems away as much as a lot of people do i don't mind a little stem it gives a little hmm. it gives it a little tooth don't you know and um i but, do know the bigger stems, I uh, I actually did some quick pickles with the some of the bigger stems because uh, um, that ought to be like a pickled asparagus in your Bloody Mary when I put that in my uh, when I put that in my uh, what do you have it red beer red beer or whatever yeah coffee so I'm, I'm excited about that hmm well I'm I'm happy to hear that you're excited about it Might I've as well. never tried one so I, yeah I'm 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 uh, empathetic with your excitement how's that no, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's all I know. <laughs> yeah. So uh, anyway, take that stuff and wash all the caterpillars and the dust out of it and uh, the dirt and uh, uh, trim it all up. Fill in my canning jars with stems as I go. And then I got my water in a rolling boil on my, uh, my Blue Star 6 burner uh, 7.8 trillion BTU gas range. And uh, mm -hmm. Blanch them for three minutes, uh, throw them in the sink full of cold water, dip them out, and uh, put them in a, a food-safe plastic bag. And heat, ah, and heat. I know. Boy, there's yeah. always that. That always falls down right there, doesn't it? Yep. I put them in my uh, vacuum seal them on my Weston uh, uh, Succomatic. I can't remember what model it is. It's Weston. I know that's the brand. They should I think the Succomatic is the 5,000, isn't it? Succomatic 5,000. Yeah, they should use that. You guys can have that if you want, if it, what the people from Weston are calling. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and then stack them up, in the, you know, right on there with a the Sharpie and stack them up in the freezer. And um, um, there you go. And then I'll have that to throw in a soup or uh, in some with some beans or whatever. It's kind of exciting for me. I have the Weston Pro 3000 vacuum sealer, stainless. Yeah. Oh. No it was close with 5,000. Yeah. No yeah. succomatic though. The succomatic would be awesome. Hmm. It would be. All right. Yeah. Now I'm going to ask you some more detailed questions about your blanching technique. Mm -hmm. You ready? Mm -hmm. Technical question number one. How much salt do you put in your water? N none. <gasps> You blanch without salt? Right. This is going to cause a rift between us, Scott. Listen, I, I don't care about I... food nearly as much as you do. That's true. You don't. No, yep. All right. I guess we're okay again then. Yeah. What's the next question? <laughs> uh, why don't you put salt in there? How dare you? <laughs> uh, I don't. I Because I, I don't care. I don't know. I can't tell the huh. difference. Yeah. Okay. I mean, by, by time can you I give you some salt. reasons why doing that would be oh, why oh, it would be oh, a good idea to put salt in there. I'm sure it changes. You can get your water. You can get your water hotter. Yeah, it does. Yep, it uh, does that. You can get your water hotter so it cooks faster, maintains the color more effectively, and it pre-seasons it. And as you said, the osmotic pressures change. It preserves a little bit better. Yeah, I, I don't doubt it at all. Um, me being me, like. Mm -hmm. By the time I hit these, by the time they hit get frozen, by the time I put them in the succum attic, then okay. I pull them out. I'm like, I can't, I can't find the last five percent. Understood. <laughs> that makes perfect sense. Okay. All right. Let me I'm see. So salted I'm just, water. I'm just proud I got across the finish line. Yeah, I mean, hey, you did it from, and you did do that from start to finish, from seed to freezer. That's right. To yeah, far out. Cool. In the toilet. Full it's circle. The, it's the circle of life. 
It is the circle of life. The meaningless meaningless line of indifference, I think, was the the modern interpretation of that. <laughs> uh, so you blanch them mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in unsalted water. Mm -hmm. I would do mine in salt, but uh, the I'll, and I'll time is dependent. Yeah, try salt, see what happens. Um, and then when you put them, when you shock them in cold water, you don't salt that water either, I'm certainly assuming. Mm -hmm. That was an old pro tip I learned in kitchens was when you blanch something that salt your cold, your ice water too, because otherwise if you take something that's salted, it's more important if you're getting ready to eat it. But if you throw something that's been in salted water into fresh water, you pull that salt back out and then the food that comes out is under salted at that point. Right. Uh, and then you strain it, mm -hmm. get all the water out. And then how do you process it from cooked and cold into the bags and into the freezer? Do you freeze it separately first or do you just shove it all into the bags? Oh, I did some where I, you know, made some balls on the cookie sheet and, and. Uh, I did the monkey fist approach. Yeah. And then froze them. And then others, I just did about a quart, um, because there aren't many times where I'm going to want a, um, the monkey fist size, uh, what is that word? Serving. Wad. Ah. <laughs> yeah, one wad. Yeah. Yeah. See. So yes, one wad. And so your your tor your normal serving size is uh in the quart is enough for your family for like one meal. So you're you're freezing based upon what essentially one meal would look like for you. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. my, that's my theory, and uh, we'll we'll see about that. <laughs> Do you wring them out pretty well first? Like give them a good squeeze and get the water out or do you yeah. put them in there pretty wet? I, I, I wring them out and then uh, I've got a little rack thing that sits in there in the sink and I even put the mm -hmm. open bag kind of, it's not upside down, but it's on a, it's on a grade there. And then, you know, and it, it continues to drip while I'm doing the rest of my business, you know, before I seal it up, ah. I put it gotcha. in, in the freezer. I can't believe you're already processing food and putting it away. I'm still, I'm was stringing up uh, peat trellises this morning. Spring peas, yeah. <laughs> sugar snap peas are exactly 10 inches tall at this point for me. And I planted them. I, I don't have my calendar in front of me, but I believe it has been in excess of two months at this point. Yeah. My green yeah. beans, I direct sowed them. I don't know when it was. And they're, they're, they're a foot tall. Oh, I haven't even considered putting green beans in the ground yet. Let me see here if I can find out when I put them in. Did Hambrick write it down? Maybe. I'll bet you did. Should have. You're pretty reliable about that sort of thing from what I can tell. I try. I do my best. Birds. No. Yeah. no, no mm -hmm. I don't know. You know. If I was being a real prick, I would do all of this in Evernote and then it would be indexed. And uh Ugh. and then I would lose all of it. Yeah. Like years from now it'd all be gone. Right. Like who? Oh, there it is. April 29th. So it's the sixteenth today. Is that correct? Sounds right. Yeah. Really? Six that's right. weeks. Yeah. Six, about seven ten, weeks. They're about ten inches tall. <sighs> my garden no, seems smaller this year there's no way it's smaller you, you like tarped like oh april no, i was like county. i did but it feels i i don't know if i've lost my mind i'm curious my sense of perspective seems off maybe you're getting bigger i'm particular oh that could be oh no <sighs> shoes aren't gonna fit me anymore mm, well. all my favorite pants will be too small <sighs> Well, we'll see. Um, yeah, everything seems like it's getting smaller. And uh, I don't know why that is. Probably because I'm growing more, but more seems like less each year. Hmm. I haven't quite figured that out yet. Yeah, it's confusing. And I'm already out of space. And I don't know how that's happened. I wish I had uh, another 5,000 feet going. Because I could, I could have some other things growing right now. <laughs> that's, <laughs> of course, <laughs> that's also outrageous. 
<laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't know if that's actually would be very smart. I've probably surpassed the uh, the healthy size of what one person should be doing, um, and uh, maybe more would not be better. Hmm. I, I did acquire a new squash patch. That's exciting. Oh yeah, I did get a couple thousand square feet extra. My uh, my dear mother in law gave me an old garden of hers. She said, "Hey, could you do anything with that?" And I was like, "You know." I could put the winter squash over there and uh, the pumpkin patch. We like to have folks over in the fall do a little pumpkin party. And uh, so I could grow some carving pumpkins. And of course, those adorable little Jack the little pumpkins. Don't worry. None will be turned into pie. I know I saw, I saw your look of concern, like pumpkins. Where is he going with pumpkins? They just essentially turn into deer food come fall time, which yeah. the deer are very happy about that. I'm not sure if they like the ones that have been, carboned inside from uh, poorly burning candles but uh, otherwise they're pretty excited about having mind. pumpkins no they might not it's been very hot here scott really hot oh. I, I know. <laughs> well it's like in the 90s hot it went from very cold to very hot then cold again and now it's very hot and then in a week it's supposed to be back down into the 40s and raining and um it's uh it's going to give you the bins, man. Yeah, it almost has. It almost has. You know, going to town the other day uh, to a, a performance of sorts, the nearest town, that that was enough to give me the bins. I'm still recovering from that experience. That was a couple of days ago. And um, I think I'm becoming less and less, less and less fit, perhaps, for... Uh, what modern culture something like that one might think that you're not ready for town but town's uh -huh. not ready for you oh that I, you know i think uh, I, i'll try looking at it that way maybe that's better <laughs> oh made me feel better already yeah. where have you gone mr hamrick oh you're back <laughs> uh, yeah town's rough so. i have to go to town tomorrow no day after tomorrow oh it's my book group. I go once a month. It seems like it's every fucking week. You know, I turn around. It's like time to get back. Time's pretty weird this time of year. Yes. Um, you said you wish you had an extra <laughs> 5,000 square feet. Boy, me too. Right. I, I really, I think that next year I will, I, I'm going to have to, I'm going to make notes in my red book. I'm going to make mm -hmm. notes in my red book to ne next year to not use every single foot I have. I have um, mm. almost 100% more garden available for next year than I do this year. But I want to have room. Mm -hmm. and I want to not have to use all of it. You know, I'd like to, I'd like to plant a few melons. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I, they need to have an empty row on either side. They're sprawling and greedy th things. You know, I, I don't yeah. have to manage them. They can, I want to let them do that. Um, and I'd like to have some that I could cover and leave and, you know, have a little room and not feel like I got to grub every penny, you know, every, everything out of it that I, I possibly can. So we'll see. I completely agree with that assessment. It's uh, hard not to though. You're like, look at that row. It looks so good. I'll have to yeah. it. I just have to put this little magic capsule down in that dirt and then like I get stuff. Yeah and, st yeah, and wait a few weeks and then voila. But it's uh it's re this reminds me of that brief discussion we started last night or last night, last week, uh in regards to uh Elul and technique. Oh, God. The, uh, the uh using efficiency, ultimate efficiency as the goal and everything. And it's it's not always a good idea. Um, and I think farming or at least market gardening, I can understand why people do it on small lots. You're trying to, you're trying to max out your production, which means maxing out your income. But there's a lot to be said. If you can make the space uh, and give the plants a little more room, um, they will take less from the soil, which means you'll have to amend less. Um, your production will go down, but there's usually a happy medium between growing as much as is reasonable or necessary versus 
having more than you can possibly do something with. Um, yeah, I've been, I've been spacing everything a little bit more this year. Um, just a little more room, not a lot, but a little more room. I, I heard a conversation with a, another market gardener years ago on a, what was a great podcast, uh, farmer to farmer. Have you ever listened to that one? Um, Chris Blanchard, I believe was his name. He died a few years ago and that was the end of the show. Um, he was just a really delightful human, um, very authentic, very kind, interesting and interested, did great interviews. And one of the last interviews he did was with a guy who was talking about who basically was just kind of fed up with trying to get as much as he possibly could out of every square foot. He's like, I don't want to do that anymore. He's like, I have a little extra room and I'm just going to do that. Like sometimes I want plants to spread out. You know, I don't need to have my lettuces nine inches apart from each other. I'm going to give them a foot, maybe 13 and a half inches, like a little, so they can open up a little bit more. It's easier. You can get in there with your cultivating tools, wire hose and collinear hose. And that says you can cruise in there. You don't have to get really fancy and use little tiny, tiny weeding heads to, uh, to try to cultivate, um, water gets to the soil better. I don't know. I've been thinking, maybe that's why I feel like I'm out of space because I have spaced everything just a little bit wider. Um, so you do yeah. need to have the bed space. You have so many more reps in than I do, but I, I've, so I've been making notes. Mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a copious note taker mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, cabbages. I think I'm going to put them in one. I think I'm going to put it in one, one single row. Next what year. kind of cabbage? I forgot. You're talking like canning or uh, canning or or preserving cabbages. Preserving cabbages. Um, so a Dutch flat, maybe that's a pretty common one. I'll let you look here. Uh, cabbages. I've been thinking about putting collards in a double row instead of a triple. Yeah, uh, I would do that. Uh, lettuce, same thing, double instead of triple. For my, uh, mm -hmm. I, I planted coastal star, and um, oh, the romaine, butter crunch. Or the lettuces I planted. I think I'm going to do double rows instead of triples. Uh, they're fine. You know, it's fine the way it is, but I'm like, why, why am I doing it? It doesn't, I, I don't need to do that. Um, I'm looking here on my notes to see what cabbage, it, which variety it was. I know I wrote it down. I guess I, I, that's what I do. Superstar. Oh, never heard of that one. I grow one called Golden Acres. That's the cabbage that uh, I found grows really well around here. They generally are uh, well, like a three to four pound is kind of peaks. They're a smaller cabbage. Um, you know, again, not like a Dutch flat. They get big and wide. Um, th those, I think, should be a single row, definitely. Uh, but the, the little golden acres, you can double row them um, and then offset them. So they're not straight across from each other. They're offset. So you get a little more space. And then I space 18 inches. I think the rows are on 15 or 18 from each other. And then the cabbage is 18 in a row from each other. And uh, that seems to be a pretty conservative, works out pretty well because they're a smaller, a smaller plant. But those big ones, cabbage plants get big, man. They get big. Yeah. Mine are hanging off in the aisles. You know, I've got 30 yeah. inch row, 30 inch beds, 18 inch aisles, which is perfect. 48 inches. And that mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense, but man, a 24 inch mm -hmm. row sure would be good. I'm clumsy as fuck. And you know, you're harvesting and you get your butt in one row and your head in the other one. And, but I'm, I'm not going to do it. I mean, cause the 48 inch math is just too, too, too tidy. It really works great. Um, if I, if I go to space, increasing these spacings though, am I going to pay when it comes cultivating time? You know, th there are no weeds in my lettuce. Yes. It, it's its own, it's its own ground cover. You know, my cabbages are their own, the collards are their own ground cover. And yep. that, that yep. probably ain't worth it. That's yeah. And that's the argument that people make. And that's why you pack, pack, pack things in tightly beyond financial reasons and trying to maximize use of space. But you do, you create a canopy and that canopy shades out weeds. Um, yep. And it does work. Um, oh, it works. It's amazing how, how well it works, how well it works. Yeah. This... Yeah. Was it rule of thumb is by the time the plant is, uh, a third, Let's see if I'm getting this right, half grown or a third grown to its full size, it should just begin touching the canopy of the one next to it. Um, 
and then I because that way, then as soon as that shade hits, nothing's going to well, things will grow, but very, very slowly underneath them. Um, but other problems begin to show up, you know, like where you are in a high humidity place. As soon as you close that canopy in and you keep that ground covered slugs. up, I can't spuds slugs. Oh, slugs. Yeah. Yeah. Luckily, it's too dry around here. Slugs will just desiccate if they there are a few of them, but it's pretty rough. Um, but slugs, fungus loves it. Um, I discovered last year, I used to pack my lettuces in pretty tight. I do 10, 10 inch rows and um, space the rows at, mm, I think a foot, something like that. And so it was just solid lettuce leaves from edge of bed to edge of bed on 30 inches. And uh, black widows moved in last year to my lettuces i've never had that happen before and i was harvesting lettuce because it was totally shaded under and there's this whole ecosystem underneath those those lettuce leaves and first time i flipped one over i was like well it looks an awful lot like a male black widow and i harvested another one i was like that looks like two male black widows like oh that's a female black widow and it, they're just everywhere never seen it happen before so that tells me that might be a little too dark and protected because they like you know the out of the way spots um, so I'm going to open that up. I'm opening up lettuces. I already did this year. I spaced them a little bit wider um, from each other row wise. Uh, is that is that true? I think it is. I know in the row I did. I've got them out to 13 and a half inches from each other now. And that's I think that's going to work a little better. So yes, you do pay for it for cultivating. You might use a little more water because you're going to get more evaporation. Um you're probably you're going to have more weed growth, would is what I've seen, and also what I would expect. But it's easier to get in there and cultivate them. And if you're constantly stirring up that soil, that's also good for the bed. Just if you're you know just working that top half inch. Um. Yeah, I don't know. I just feel like that a little more space. I think it's going to be better. <laughs> Like kale too. I don't do triple rows of kale anymore. I think they get too crowded in the center one. I always notice that that center plant suffers and it's smaller than the ones on the outside. And I was like, I'm just going to take them out. This is dumb. I end up with these little puny guys. And then when the aphids move in, which they do every year, they always attack the center first. I was like, I'm going to take the center out, attack make center. everyone big and healthy. Yes. Attack the center. It's worked before. <laughs> I like that. Let's see here. Where is it? Where's my 2024 garden plan? Here we go. Yeah, um, I'm just I'm going to call an audible. I'm going to call it right now. Uh, I'm actually going right. to go. I'm going to do I'm going to do two by twos on the on the on the cabbages instead of a single row. Um, I think I'm I'm still going to get full coverage. <laughs> the soil underneath there. Um, yeah, and uh, I'll do the same with the collards. Um, uh, yep, yeah, I'll do the same with the collards. Dee 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 dee. Notes taken. Now next year you'll remember you'll when it's time for planting. Yeah. 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 And uh yeah. I'll make some notes there and yeah, we'll have less waste next year. It's gonna be good. I just got a text from our friend. I don't know if he's I say our friend, my friend. He soon will be your friend, Todd. Mm -hmm. Travis Yarborough. Um oh. you know Travis Yarborough, Yarborough Homestead, um real life farmer out in uh, Montgomery. Oh, is that why? And, uh, that might be why I recognize his name. Yeah, follow him on a uh, on a uh, on Instagram if y'all if y'all care. Uh, they're they're doing all the things: uh, chickens, turkeys, pigs, uh, regenerative grazing, the whole thing. But uh, he just took in one of his uh, Salatin broil broiler shelters after ten years. Oh, come on, come on. Let me see here. I'll see if I can turn this off so you can see. This is a uh, this is good. This is good. Uh, this is good. Good pod right here. Uh, yeah. So he took it in, flipped it over. And after, uh -huh. 10, after 10 years, he's only having to replace, um, he's only have to replace those bottom boards. Uh, so he's gotten 10 years of oh. service out of that, out of that. Um, yeah. Out of that, uh, salad and shelter. And uh, he's in Alabama and he's in Montgomery, Alabama. Yeah. That's really, that's different. amazing. So up here it would last like, three, 400 years before it would need to be replaced. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, 
yeah, mine are doing well. I had to, uh, I had to screw a couple things back together. Uh, I made some changes to mine. I put wheels under it, permanent wheels under them that I can stomp on a lever and it raises them up. Um, um, they're great. They're much improved. Um, the, the little lift kit, the wheel kits I put under them, I already need have a modification I needed to make to those things. Um, but I'm really, ha mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really happy. Um, yeah, with them now it's, it's much better. Um, and you're, and you've got one of them's loaded up with broilers right now, correct? Well, more it, corners cross. Yeah. One of them's got corners cross in it and I'm going to move out 70 more tonight, to this evening or tomorrow. So I'll have two mm. out there in the fleet and then, uh, I'll have a third one out there in about 18 more days after this, after this. Um, so that'll make our last butcher date of uh, flight one on July 8th. And then we're going to start it up again about September 1st and we'll run another, another few batches through. Um, they suck, man. They're such weird animals. Such what, weird corn, animals. The corners, corners cross. Birds and just the meat birds in general. Yeah. Yeah. They're meat birds in general, but corners. Yeah. Cross. Oh, you gotta go. The, the old, the old farmer or, uh, farm and homestead breeds the multi-purpose birds it's, it's got to be the way to go i tell you i feel like we're at the end of a lot of stupid ideas right now i and i've had that sense like i mean i, I generally have it i hope we're at the end of stupid ideas we're not. maybe like they've just played and yeah i know we're not we how about this we're far enough down the line in many of our stupid ideas that it's becoming harder and harder to ignore how stupid they are is that better yeah, that could be, but <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> um, man, I tell you, the Cornish Cross is a stupid animal, but man, fifty-four know, days, pack a lot of yeah, they're days, fast. Man. And good God, you know, you're as opposed to fourteen weeks, you know, for a ranger or something like that. And um, uh, you know, I'm not interested in tending them. For yeah, for filling for filling a freezer. God. Yeah, I know. You no, know? it's four, 14 weeks for a ranger, really, for a freedom ranger. Yeah, I think that's right. Versus nine weeks. Yeah. <sighs> yeah, eight weeks, dude. Eight weeks. Yeah, but they're gross. They're gross. I mean, these animals, they don't grow feathers and they die from heart disease when they're a month old. Yeah, if you figure them out, they don't. <laughs> okay <laughs> you know i mean i you know i figured them out and they're doing great um the the you know the feed conversion rate on them is fucking 35 percent astronomical that's that's uh, amazing the, yeah they're it, it, and they're amazing um now i'm looking here at freedom ranger performance objectives um uh, a 10-week bird they're saying that's a live weight of six six and Two thirds of a pound, six point six five pounds. Um, so it's pretty close to five cleaned out, yeah, four and a half five. Yeah, in ten weeks. So seventy. Yeah, that's only another week. Four. Yeah. No, it's. I it's th this more this. Weeks. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> I said that and I was like that. That math wasn't right. This is two weeks. Yeah, Fe feed I, conversion rate. They're claiming this. This, this applies to what I was saying earlier. They're they're claiming here. This is freedomrangerhatchery.com. They are claiming, you know, 35 <laughs> as well. I, I don't doubt it. Um, sure. Yeah, I don't doubt it. But I will tell you this. The normal mm. consumer, the normal modern American consumer right. does not want to look right. at a Freedom Ranger carcass with the big old drums no, in the, in the weird breast they don't like them. Mm -mm. It looks like a pheasant. It looks like somebody killed a pheasant or a tiny ostrich or something, and they don't like them. Mm, and they have a slightly uh, reptilian flavor to them. I've noticed. I like them, but they definitely have. You can you can taste the dinosaur in every bite more so than you can in a uh, <laughs> <laughs> more more so than a, a Cornish. Yeah. 
that's what we become accustomed to. But this also applies to what I was just saying about the idea of like always going for efficiency. There's always something is always given up. You know, it depends on what you what you want to emphasize. If you're going to emphasize efficiency, you're going to lose something somewhere else. This is this is not just a net gain. And I'm and I'm sure. I'm always weighing that out. What am I what am I gaining by this? What am I losing by this choice? And um yeah, it's tough too, because this is also the water that we swim in, is that we are always told that more efficiency is always better. You know, if I have to make fewer trips around my garden, that's better. Like, well, is it? I don't know. Sometimes I've actually had some of my best thoughts, both gardening and otherwise, when I'm just walking around and just simply I have the time to let my mind still and and be with my thoughts or I'm observing something that I wouldn't have seen otherwise because I was working so hard to make sure that I did that with as least effort as possible. Well, you know, the old adage of the best fertilizer is the farmer's footprints. There's no sense to free lunch, man. You know, no, there is not. Uh, if one wishes to ever get in an argument with, um, you know, a Twitter communist or something like this, if why I, on earth would anybody waste their time doing that? <laughs> um, you, find, you find that capitalism is a direct response or a direct result of rationality you know you might know your soil and your garden better if you got down your hands and knees and made a claw with your hand and cultivated the whole thing like that sure but you also have other things you need to do so you 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 make a you make a wooden claw and you put it on the handle so you don't have to get on your hands and knees and now you can do it in a tenth of the time you Mm -hmm. know because people are rational and because there is scarcity in the world, people will tend to look for efficiencies. Sure. Um, and I'm obviously not arguing against efficiency. Or right. I should hope that that's obvious. Okay. And, and, the, and the, the problem is with efficiency, you have to say in the face of what? It, it, like, mm-hmm. you know, at one point we ended up with this fucking washer and dryer that was high efficiency. Well, what that uh, means is it doesn't use any water. It had nothing to do with whether it got the clean, the clothes clean. Now I've got a or how much electricity it uses. Or, yeah. It's still a twenty amp motor that's just you know cranking through the electrons to make it work, just with less water. It just used less water, and it and uh, you know it had a seal around the door as a front loading machine. So when you weren't using it, it wouldn't dry out. And it would just get mildew around the se- the seal, and you <laughs> you know your towels smelled like mildew, just garbage. Now I've got a speed queen. Mm-hmm. It's actually high efficiency in terms of getting clothes clean, but it uses something like 45,000 gallons a load, which I'm fine with because I don't live in Tucson. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so when you talk about productivity or efficiency, you have to say efficiency in terms of what? Right. It's always in relation. Right. In terms of What? And that, that's, that's the problem. You know, I can broad fork a row, one of my hundred foot rows, lickety split. I don't even know. 11 minutes, 14 minutes. 14. I could, I could certainly imagine 14. I'm, I can do beds that have been only forked for many years now from start to finish is eight minutes, eight to nine. Yeah. It, 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 no, I can probably do it quicker than I can till it mm-hmm. with your, with a BCS, mm-hmm. but I can't fork for 18 hours. Or I can't fork for eight hours. Mm-hmm. I couldn't keep up that pace for eight hours. I sure. couldn't, I, I could do it for eight hours, but I couldn't keep up that pace. That last bed would be. 21 minutes. <laughs> I don't even. <laughs> yeah. Each one going. Yeah. But you can walk behind the tiller for eight hours. Mm, that'd be a terrible eight hours, but yeah, you could. Yeah. You could put your head, you know, put your earphones on, you know, and um, yeah, you can get it done. But, you know, so that's, you know, that's the thing. What are we doing? Well, in, in, efficient in terms of what? Mm-hmm. I don't know, man. Well, man, that's, 
Perhaps that's the important part. It's not making a blanket statement of saying that your goal is going to be ultimate efficiency all the time. Um, or that you're going to avoid looking for efficiency because something is lost in it. It's a reassessment of what you're doing constantly and paying attention and then just adapting where it makes sense, figuring out what works, what doesn't work, um, what the costs and benefits are of everything, and then always being open to changing it and trying, you know, making slight variations to see if something works better for you. Um, and then with time, you will find, hopefully ha find that happy medium uh, between efficiency and what is the opposite it's not inefficiency inefficiency waste sure no all right i could go to waste yeah these are the thoughts i've been having in the garden lately yeah i don't know these are the thoughts i've been having about the world lately and then i apply them to the garden yeah, no, I that. And then I rattle around in my own head down there by myself, and then I come up and sit in front of a computer, and then go, hmm. hmm. Yeah. Hmm. In the meantime, everything's growing really well. Well, that's nice. Everyone looks happy here. No Ooh. disasters so far. I keep looking out the window because we're supposed to have devastating thunderstorms are in the forecast for the next five days with hmm. hail and damaging rain. So... Maybe yeah. that's making me a little edgy. Yeah. I don't like electrical storms either. <laughs> uh, so how far out are you from being able to put up food? Put up food? Oh, yeah. uh, hmm. I have harvested nothing from the garden yet. Putting up, I'm at least probably two months. Before I begin putting food up, <laughs> I might, I mean, the re <laughs> well, the reason I say that is my markets get the first flush of everything. You know, we eat it as it comes in, but we don't, we don't preserve the beginning. Right. Um, I have to get my foot in the door everywhere and start selling right away. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm probably a couple months, uh, and that'll be kales and kales and chard will be the first things that we blanch and put up um how much how much yeah. how much kale will you put away uh, for three three uh, eaters two of which don't eat any food uh pounds or i'll do volume because i don't even know however many i don't know how many pounds and if i do like raw volume that's almost depressing and, and seems an impossibility when i see all the harvest totes that come up like you're talking about you go down to the feed sack and then you like three quarts like well, that was a lot of work for three quarts it's amazing how cheap food is um but machines right or very cheap labor you pay someone a dollar an hour and all of a sudden you can get a lot of work done for very little money um we will put away uh well, my technique is also to do the the what I call that monkey fist. It, it's a big ass monkey. It's not a monkey fist. Monkeys have pretty small hands. It's actually more like a Todd fist, um, which is pretty good size. Um, so imagine a size eleven glove making a fist. One of those is a compressed wad of blanched kale or chard, and I will probably put a uh, hundred to 120 of those in kale away for the year. Yeah, actually 120 plus and 100 plus of those in chard. So for just greens, yeah, somewhere around 220 to 250 balls. Yeah, double extra large glove fist size balls. A, and I do frozen... Uh, no, half it's probably a cup. cup and a half. Good Lord. You know what they say? Big hands, big gloves. Big hands, mm -hmm. big, big kale balls. Big feet. There you go. <laughs> they make for very large kale balls. Um, and that'll say, I mean, that's a harvest tote, you know, that, which is one of those plastic 
shipping or the, uh, I guess, transport containers, whatever you call them, the ones that have the lids built in and, and fold over and that interlacing clamshell sort of pattern. Um, one of those completely full of just leaves, stems cut off. Actually, and I peel the stems out of all my kale and chard. I cut it out of the chard. I peel it out of the kale. That'll do like maybe 10, maybe 10 of those balls. Yeah. It's a lot. I did about <laughs> it's, I did about three gallons total of pollards, which will be yeah. not enough. I'll do some more. Are you, yeah, I'm not done turning it over. I'm not going to do. I'll probably do six gallons total, which will give. And that's me, enough for you. Probably not. Mm. I don't know. You know that'll give it. We, we can have them about. We can have them once every other week, probably. Well, actually, um, we'll have them fresh here for a while longer, then I'll have them fresh again in the fall. So mm -hmm. if I put away six gallons total, I can probably have it every other, every week and a half. Mm -hmm. I have colors every week and a half. Oh yeah. You need to put a lot more away. Maybe you should be eating colors. Yeah. I mean, cause we eat those a couple times a week too. Yeah. And as far as, you know, talking about preserving and, and in this case, blanching and freezing, um, my technique is salted water, salty, almost like the ocean salty mm. is my rule of thumb. Must um, be nice. what, well, what, what must be nice? I don't know. That's just <laughs> having what access to that much salt. That's just what assholes say. <laughs> That's a terrible thing to say. Someone it it's must very be derailing. Nice. <laughs> it is nice. But that's um, the answer. That's the only answer. Yeah. I love uh, it. The only part that isn't nice is if you have, um, you have to have somewhere to put a lot of salty water when you're all done and you have to change it out. You know, if you're just, you can't just pour it out, say on the ground, cause you'll kill everything with it. If you have a gray water system, it's probably not going to be all that great to pour super salty water down it. Something to consider. See, that's um, why I don't use it. It's more environmentally sound. That's why I don't do it. There you go. And cause kosher <laughs> salt costs $6 a box now. <laughs> um, salty water, like the ocean, covered to bring up to a rolling boil. I do it all outside on my uh, camp chef, like we're a camp explorer extraordinaire and um, a bowl of uh, cold water. I don't use ice because ice is just a pain. I, I'm just not really an ice guy across the board. I don't like it in my drinks. I don't like it in my my chilling water. How are you going to have enough ice to, 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 to chill three gallons of boiling greens anyway? Uh, I, mean, that, that I don't know the ice tray to freezer. Ice. It does take a lot of ice. I don't know. I turned off the ice, the, the ice maker in our freezer. Actually, I never even, never even turned it on. When we had to replace it, I just unhooked the entire thing. I was like, "There we go. No ice taking up all that valuable space and breaking things in here." Um, so big bowl, a uh, stainless bowl with cold water in it. Blanch everybody. Depends on what it is that I'm blanching, how long. Not very long. I don't want it cooked. I want it par cooked. Yeah. Um, I want it to finish cooking in the dish. But I want it cooked enough that if you just took a raw kale leaf and froze it, it would just turn to mush um, when it thawed out. Because all those cell walls would rupture as the liquid inside expands, breaks all the cell walls, and then... Um, so you want to cook it and allow that plant to actually preserve better. That's part of the reason you're, you're blanching. Uh, well, actually that is the reason you're blanching um, and space too, because space the volume decreases by 80%. Um, salty water into slightly salted cooling water. Um, it goes in there, it comes out and then goes into a, a strainer. And let it strain our colander, let it strain or just drain out while I'm doing everybody. And then I, I wring it out. I'll squeeze it, get as much water as possible out. And then I'll roll those fists, put them on parchment line sheet pan, um, and then put that into the freezer and freeze them individually. And then when they're frozen, then they come out and then they get bagged and labeled. So much. That is my technique. It is a lot of work, I, but you're right. I do. I, you know, I have a background in, uh, in professional food world for a long, long time. And I do put a lot of effort into food. It's kind of one of my things. Um, yeah, I don't know. You know, if I didn't love food so much, I'm not sure I would farm. 
Um, if you grow your own mm -hmm. and you're a bad cook. <laughs> that's that's terrible. <laughs> no, it's not. Your food will be better than a good cook who buys this stuff at the store. Ah, uh, sure. I mean, most I certainly. Mean, unless you're so bad that you just like can't pull it off. Sure. You know, uh, if I if I roast one of my chickens with my potatoes and my onions and my stuff on it, and I don't get all the details right, it is going to be better than the one where somebody got all the details right with the stuff from yep. the store. It it just is. You know, we uh, the the ingredients well, the, are yeah it makes all the difference. Yeah, you know, we're trying to get that last twenty percent. I mean, I, actually, I'm not. I want to eat food that's not poison so that my kids and my grandkids don't end up being trannies. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what I'm about. And but so if I've got the food that's not tainted, you know, I'm already there. there. For me, I'm there. But if you're looking, if you're a foodie, you're going to get 80% of the improvement just, you know, from having your own ingredients. Right. And then yeah. technique is that last 20%. Yeah. Because if you For have five. bad raw ingredients, well, yeah, it depends, but yeah, it's technique matters, but the raw ingredients matter more. Um, you know, if you have really good raw ingredients or beginning ingredients, your job as a cook is to not screw them up. Yeah. You know, that's, that's all you have to do is like, don't, don't degrade them in any way. Now that's easy to do for a lot, a lot of people. Um, and that's where the technique part comes in is because then you actually know how to do that and you can do it consistently instead of once in a while, like, Oh, Hey, that's good. Um, when you can consistently be happy with what you're getting. Um, we found yeah, ourselves away from home at mealtime. Oh no. Some, you know, whenever it was a week ago, I don't know, whenever it was. And, um, wife and old daughter and and I went uh, we ended up going to this Italian restaurant and I don't know what I got I don't even care um and <laughs> wife got, got something with chicken in it and she said uh she said this chicken's bad like there's something and uh I my daughter forked it you know and She's like, no, it's just, it's store chicken, mom. It's fine. Yeah, that's, you know, what a, that's what a tortured animal tastes like that's been eating poison. Charity hadn't had, um, Charity hadn't had a, you know, store chicken two years, something like that. And it's all fucked up. It's gross. And you need that perspective to, to recognize that. Yeah. You know, our, uh, our mutual friend, Eric sent me a, um, a line from a book the other day, I think it was from Wendell Berry and, uh, talking about essentially getting people to see if I can remember this properly, getting them to pay attention to their food and that would change things. Um, I don't think that's the case. I think it takes, uh, I think it takes more than that. You have to, you have to, you have to change everything and you have to keep it changed for a long time um, before you can recognize just how bad it is. Essentially, you know, if people, if you don't have access, if you haven't eaten food that is the way food should be, you're not going to know what you're missing. Mm -hmm. You're like, I don't know. Like your, like your daughter saying, no, it's just store chicken. Let's do it. Most chicken. people don't know. So they don't like the, the effort doesn't make any sense. Like, why would you support this? Why would you support higher prices for, you know, uh, something that's grown from a local person who's using regenerative methods or whatever? They're like, I don't know. I don't care. I can't really taste the difference. That's what I'm accustomed to. I mean, this is the uphill battle of agriculture, right? Because obviously big ag, it works for producing calories, but that's all it does back to that efficiency thing. If its goal is just to make money and produce calories, period. And I, I get it. There is utility to producing calories. I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with that, but you lose a lot of there that you lose a lot in what farming can be, what farming should be. And the consumer of it loses a lot 
by consuming it. What they, they don't know what they're missing from ill health, from the consumption of herbicides, pesticides, fungicides, GMO products. Most people can't tell the difference. Most people suck and are gross. Most people <laughs> don't matter. Um, you know, I was talking to my uncle about this before before we fired up here today, Todd. And we were t he was talking about how do you offer a high quality product or service? You know, how do you price it? Um, how do you price it in in light of the fact that to produce a high quality service, you'll have to have highly compensated professional people to do that to render the service. And then how do you mm -hmm. how then do you price the end product to or the end service to the user, the customer, and all that? And we, we were talking about it, and I said, well, you don't understand. The problem is actually marketing. Like, mm -hmm. and it's not advertising. I think there's a distinction between marketing and advertising. Advertising is selling something that people already know about and just telling them that you do it. I fix broken air conditioners, call 918, blah, blah, blah. That's advertising. Steve Jobs showed up with an iPhone. Nobody knew what the fuck it was. He had to actually create a market for that. It was like an entirely new device. People, he had to create a, he had to, he had to show a use case for it, tell people how it mattered and convince them to buy it. And then he would advertise. And then advertising is you tell them how much it is and where it is and why they buy it from you. I think that I think that civilization is so debased and so degraded that you would actually have to create a marketing plan to sell a high quality product in almost every single arena because nobody nobody even knows what it is. Right. Like it's like 2004 and somebody has an iPhone. Like yeah. what is that? My my Motorola flip phone works. Why do I want an iPhone? Well, it has a GPS on it. It has a camera on it. You can check your email, blah, 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 blah. This is what it costs five times as much, but you also don't have to carry your laptop when you do business travel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, at this point, you have to do the same kind of marketing job to get somebody to buy food that doesn't suck. Right. And it's, and by the way, it's not going to fucking work. No, it won't. You know, I try to sell chickens. And people, and, and you wouldn't, I, I won't say you, I am shocked by how many people that say, I don't know how to cook a whole chicken. To which I say, well, cut it up into pieces that you recognize that you do know how to cook and then cook those. People don't know how to cut them up. They don't know how to cut them up. I mean, they, they don't even know what to do. You know, can I throw that in there really quick for some of the listeners and saying, yeah, actually, I don't know how to do that. Jacques Pepin and Julia Childs uh, I think all those videos are probably available um, on oh, yeah. YouTube or whatever. The their what is it French? Not no, what they call it French cooking with Julia and Jacques or something along those lines. Oh, right. Big discussion on basic techniques and uh, you know like there's Jacques the great Jacques Pepin with like okay here's how you break down a chicken here's a whole bird. You know, I mean, it's feathers and guts and whatnot are missing, but it's like, it's from the store, it's from the butcher. Now you need to break this thing down. Here's how you take the backbone out. Here's how you split it in half down the breast. And now you've got two chicken halves and here are the cuts you make for whatever you want. Do you want just thigh? Do you want airline breast? All these different things. It's not hard. Almost anybody can figure right. it out, but it's, it takes time. It takes practice. It takes a dedication that you're saying, okay, I'm going to give up whatever for many people it means screen time of some sort um now uh some sort of like digital entertainment uh to do spend more time cooking and this is an argument that wendell berry has been making forever that joel salatin is still making um that people in like until home economics becomes important again this market will remain limited let and me. I don't know what it would actually take for it to become important again, because once people lose the ability, and we've talked about this, you know, the idea of like learning how to do this sort of thing again, growing your own food, raising your own animals, building fence, pruning trees, doing home repair, all those sorts of things, skills that a lot of people used to have that's been lost as humans have looked for greater and greater efficiency. 
we've been losing that. And then for those of us who've just said, no, I need to learn these skills and apply them and integrate that into my life, into my life. That's a limited handful of folks that are going to do that. Yeah. But, um, don't be a perfectionist. Watch Julian no. and Jock cooks illustrated the, the, the America's great one. kitchen will cooks illustrated stuff. Fantastic. The magazine mm -hmm. and their books better than fantastic. F f wonderful. But don't worry about it. You're not going to mess it up. Like it won't be perfect, but it'll get in the pan and it'll get cooked and you'll turn it into poop. Don't worry about it. Just get in there and struggle and juggle. Just get it. Who cares? It also makes things easier when you're using really delicious homegrown or, you know, local farmer ingredients, it's less work on the cook's part to make them good. And if it's less difficult, that means you will spend less time doing it probably, or the time you do spend doing it will be more enjoyable. Um, also because the end result will encourage you to keep doing that. You will also have less stuff in your kitchen. If you can simplify your ingredients as the quality goes up. You don't need to have, you know, for instance, a spice drawer with all of your spice island jars that some of them were purchased. You know, you got them from your grandma when Nixon was president. And there's that that little jar of marjoram sitting in the back that's just powder, powder at this point and maybe like husks from some uh, meal moths and that's it. You can start thinning it down. You're like, well, there are only like one or two cooking fats that I use. Okay, great. I don't even need to think about the other stuff. I can you know, just stop using seed oils. I'm just going to use animal fat only and coconut fat. And there. Great. Okay. Like now you're saving money. And I know I'm coming back to the efficiency thing again, but it's efficiency that makes sense. That is applied efficiency. You've, you've figured out why you are doing this. Not just for the sake of efficiency. It's for the sake of this is actually bringing some sort of benefit to me or benefits. Um, and then your ingredient list gets smaller. And then all of a sudden you start buying less processed food. And then all of a sudden you feel a little bit better. And uh, before you know it, like we're all dancing in the streets and they're flowing with milk and honey and uh, the problems are solved. And there we go. Is this why? <laughs> so you talk about the spice rack. You know, I've got uh -huh. my garlic, my onions. Uh -huh. And you got salt. Yep. Like pepper, what I mean, we've got some, but just peppercorns. Have peppercorns in a pepper grinder. Don't buy pre ground. It's terrible. Or just red pepper, you know, that I grew. Yeah, I mean, I yeah pepper flake. I know, yeah. I know it's different, but uh, you know, and that that stuff ends up being so flavorful and and good that you're 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 ninety percent there. You know, maybe you want rosemary. You can grow that. Maybe you want a mm -hmm. things on it. Maybe you want a few things, but. You don't, you don't need much. Mm -mm. Uh, have you seen, Todd, have you seen Zoe Berry, I think is her name, um, the Spice Mama? <laughs> the Spice Mama? No, I can't say that I have. Well, I'm going to go find her, and we're going to watch her little short video. Okay. Uh, um, and we're going to get in trouble, but... Are we? You know, Why? Yeah, oh yeah, for sure. But you know, I came to play. I came to play. <laughs> you're you're pulling me into something. Wait, hold on. <laughs> where where are you taking me right now? <laughs> uh, there there is a there's a meme out there that mm -hmm. white people don't use spices. Ah, uh, have you heard this? No, I but I don't get out much. Yeah, there is, and uh, there's a nice lady named Zoe. They don't use spices. Wait, white people don't use spices. What what sort of nonsensical statement is that? And why would you make a distinction that way? Listen, I, I, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't create the internet. Al Gore did. <laughs> All right. I, who knows? This is his fault. Yeah. So I'm looking. I'm looking for her dang this dang video. It went around the internet. I don't know several months ago, and it's just the most wonderful thing in the world. And she talks about. She just talks about cooking. Oh come on. Where is it? Um, this is great pod. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna find it and we're gonna watch it together because it's it's the it's just Connect through. it's just wonderful. Well, while you while you look about that, let me throw out my opinion too on black pepper. How's mm -hmm. that sound? So people can consider this. Don't cook with black pepper. Don't buy pre ground 
ever. Just buy whole peppercorns and own a pepper mill. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, they are completely different experiences to have fresh ground pepper versus pre-ground pepper. Um, first off, you know that if you're grinding it yourself, it's actually a peppercorn because you can see them. And you don't know, and you can assume that in the, the pre-ground stuff, there's all sorts of interesting things mixed in there too. It's cut with like rat fur and, you know, floor sweepings from this, whatever. Baby aspirin. There you go. And uh, laxative. And uh, the flavor is completely different. It's floral. It's, it's enlivening to food. But when you cook it, it makes it musty and kind of acrid. Yep, enlivening. And so if you finish your food, don't cook with it, but finish it with a couple of twists of fresh black pepper. And it is a totally different experience than cooking with it. So when someone says in a recipe, season your fish, they usually mean black, they mean pepper and salt. You can skip the pepper. They say season, just read salt. Learn how to salt things this is properly. A and, uh, oh, I just found it. All right. So learn how to season things properly with salt, and that will solve about 80% of the bad cooking in the world is if people know how to season properly. Let's see. And by season, I mean salt. Oh, this is so, right. this is so good. I have no idea what this is that we're about to see. Are you nervous? I'm a little bit nervous. <laughs> okay, here she is. Uh -huh. This is a PSA to the seasoning police on this app. If in your brain you only view seasoning as things like garlic powder onion powder or maybe something like rosemary if this is what you view as seasoning and seasoning only let me pose you a question what does this come mm. from granulated garlic what is that garlic onion powder what does that come from dehydrated onion let's take a look at the spice rub dehydrated garlic onion and bell pepper i sauteed those bell peppers along with my onion and garlic Hmm. What is so funny to me is if I had just doused my chicken in this rub, in this rub alone, the seasoning police would be out of my comments. They wouldn't even be in there. But the second it's fresh garlic or fresh onion or fresh bell pepper, it's automatically not seasoning. And let me just say one last thing. If you're one of those people that loves to watch cooking competitions and a judge says something is under seasoned, they're talking about salt. Under seasoning your food means there's not enough salt in it. Salt is gonna bring out the flavor of onion, the flavor of garlic, the flavor of whatever random spice rub that you have. And let me just say that if your food tastes a little off, it's not because you need to add more powder. It's most of the time because you need to add more salt or some sort of acid like lemon juice or vinegar, okay? This is a PSA to the seasoning police on this app. If there in your you brain- Oh, what do you know? So I, I, I led into that perfectly and didn't even know that was how she was going to finish. Is all of TikTok done in that bizarre Sm uh, smash fast fashion and those and that weird editing? That's why people get hooked on it. Oh. That was I've never seen a TikTok video before. Yeah. <laughs> that was really weird, Scott. I feel like, oh, oh no. Oh. But how wonderful is Miss Zoe? I, I do like her uh, spice. <laughs> she's yeah, she's, so she's correct too. But yeah. that was that medium is horrible. Wow. Okay, this okay, is the dish breakdown more. where I break down a dish so you never have to rely on. Oh no! Don't do it to me again. Oh, chicken parmesan. Oh, chicken, chicken parm when making chicken parmesan, you'll want to make sure that you use chicken breasts, and because chicken breasts are not very flat, you'll want to slice them in half horizontally and then pound them down until they have a uniform width. This will ensure they cook nice and evenly. When it comes to coating the chicken, you're going to want to make sure that they are seasoned in layers. This means adding salt and pepper to your initial flour coating, adding salt and pepper to your egg, and if you're looking for a depth of flavor, you can add a little bit of Dijon mustard, and then finally you'll want to add a little bit of. Everything sped up. It, it's. Ugh. Yeah, it's astounding, but she she's great. Is that how is that how yeah. she, now she does that? Does is that kind of typical of TikTok? Oh no, is that wait. how that that platform works? No, you never see her ass. You know, she doesn't dance. Oh, that's oh, that's typical TikTok. The only thing I know about it was well, now that and of course the dancing nurses during the lockdown, and that was all I ever heard of. But I've never experienced it. Oh, well, good. Now I know not to ever turn that on. But she does cram an awful lot of information, this Zoe woman, uh, in very short order. And yeah. if she's helping people actually make their own food, that's fantastic. Yeah, she, yeah, she's great. She knows she went to you know cooking school and she knows what she's doing and she does some longer form sure. stuff. She has a sub stack and she does a cooking newsletter. And yeah, she's figured out the game, but she she knows what's up. Hmm. 
smart. It's too bad that it takes that people have to be. She's easy on the eyes. That people have to be. Well, sure. Yeah. I mean, she's a pretty woman. She knows what she's talking about. And then she uses a format that essentially hijacks. <laughs> I'm not even sure what part of my brain that hijacked. You want to watch another shut one? You find yourself mysteriously yeah. wanting to see more? No, I don't. I, yeah, I know what you mean. Actually, no, I feel like I've been punched just on the, not quite my temple, but just on the outside of my eye where the orbital ridge isn't broken, but I don't feel like, oh, that was really bad as the temple's right here. And it rings some part of my bell that is different than like a chin punch. Uh, I don't she, like that. Yeah. That's a, that's, that's a prefrontal punch. No, prefrontal. <laughs> Free frontal is just square between the oh, eyes, just get punched in the forehead, <laughs> which is, gets funnier to see the the look on the person's face who does it to you because the forehead is a terrible thing to punch. <laughs> it's oh, pretty stout. I just got a, huh. I, just got, I just got an email to this book. Uh -huh. Some guy named Omar emailed me. I just left you a five star review because John Senior and the Restoration of Realism uh, was incredible. This is the online great books podcast I did with Carl. Uh -huh. Um, blah, 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 blah. From a fellow podcaster, it seems like you've got a ton of room to grow based on your content. Have you thought about fully repurposing your podcast content for socials? What does that mean? I, it, it means he wants to Ser sell. Seriously, I'm not, trying. He, I'm, he, I'm not trying to like be clever. I don't know what that means. Like you know, recontent your, re have, wait, repackage your content for socials. Sorry, I have to, I'm going to keep cutting you off because those, the words make sense, but not in that order. I assume he means cut it up into little sound bites and use video so we could put it on TikTok or Instagram or YouTube or whatever. And the answer is, yeah, I've thought of it. I don't care. Right. And, um, yeah, who cares? Um, hmm. I used, uh, we've been putting this show on YouTube. We have. <laughs> yeah. Online, great, uh, online, great books. Um, and barbell logic, um, you know, I was on the Barbell Logic show for 350 episodes or something like that. And we put it on YouTube and nothing would happen. Like people would watch it, but then they don't buy anything. Mm -hmm. um, people will watch videos and, and we're going to put, we're putting this on YouTube and people will watch it. And I think a lot of times they, when they watch a video about weightlifting, when they watch a video about this, they think that it, it pushes the same psychological button, at least <laughs> obliquely, that actually doing it does. <laughs> Right. And um, I have found that YouTubers are all stingy, mostly are stingy do it yourselfers, and they don't really actually buy anything. And, mm -hmm. um, um, and I can't even imagine putting this on TikTok and thinking that somebody on TikTok was going to like, you know, hire you for, you know, whatever. And I can you imagine if I were on TikTok. Yeah, trying to <laughs> can you imagine trying to get people to sign up for a great books program by putting stuff on YouTube? I mean, that's just there's no <laughs> way that's gonna work. That doesn't that doesn't jive at the it's actually anathema to each other. Hey, yeah. how would you like to concentrate? We're gonna ask for long stretches of time and concentration and effort from you where you're the one that needs to do the work, and then you can come together with others who have done the same thing and discuss it versus having it presented to you yeah, as a, uh, a product. Yeah, they're not going to do it. No, that's crazy. Hmm. Boy, John Sr. Um, oh, man. What yeah, one of, our, uh, one of our internet friends, uh, Paul, sent me a picture. He, uh, he, was, uh, he managed to go to, uh, I don't even know where the hell it is, but he, he, he found John Sr.'s um, grave. And, uh, hmm. yeah, and went, went and spent a little time there where, where they planted old John. <sighs> I don't know. It's time to start talking about pre preserving food. Um, you need to go ahead and order your bags for your succomatic, uh, and make sure jar lids. jar lids. Oh, do you want to give an update on your jar lids? Uh, the update is I sent them back last week. The company will still remain nameless. I believe that a machine tried to have a conversation with me by email over the weekend, um, which was confusing and then dismaying and then slightly depressing. That was the range of emotions that I experienced. Um, and as of this morning at 6, 10 AM, I got a notification that all of the lids minus 
uh, 120 of the 360 regular mouth lids. Those are back ordered. Um, but I, all my wide mouth are on their way and most of the, um, most of the regular mouth. So they're in the mail as of today. And I will remain optimistic that they will show up, uh, just fine. I spoke to a couple different people through customer service and I said, so Am I the only person that got a batch of oh yeah in excess of a, a thousand uh, bad lids? And they said, "Yep, never heard of that otherwise." I said, "Huh? Well, what luck?" Um, because I went through nearly every single one of them, and they were all messed up. And, and listen, so you know that isn't true. I, what are you trying to tell me? Wait, we're not going to have a discussion about the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus too, right now, are we? Uh, no. Okay, good. Yeah, no, I realize it's not true. It can't be. It can't be. How it be? And actually, I said that to the last person. I said, "Really, I'm the only person that uh, that ended up with 1,200 plus canning lids that each one was messed up." I was like, "Well, hell, I'm going to go buy a lottery ticket right now. I've never done that either. Why not? I just saw TikTok for the first time. Now I go. I'm going to go buy a lottery ticket, and uh, I can't lose." They've got a punch machine, strip it machine, whatever. That's punching out those rounds out of a some stock that has a, you know, vinyl gasket on one side. And then they mm -hmm. put the, then those things are all collated and then stamped so that they have the right profile. And then they're put in packaging and there's no way that that defect was confined exactly to the number of lids or less than you ordered because no, the people, whoever this is makes hundreds of thousands of them every day. Yeah. And the error they made, is a thousand is a thousand lids a minute, ten thousand lids a minute, and it took them longer than a minute to catch it. Whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, now I I wouldn't be surprised, Todd, if nobody else has called. Because we're back. To I wouldn't our... be surprised either. You know how do you market? Our lids are defect free every time. They cost more. They'll always be perfect, and. Uh, our acceptable error rate is 0 0.0025%. And our competitor's error rate is, you, know, you, you can't market it. I mean, you can, but... No, it'll be for wing nuts and Amish grandmothers will be the only ones who get really excited about that. And you can't market to Amish grandmothers because they're not plugged into anything. You can't reach them. Right. And wing nuts aren't going to trust you no matter what you say. So either they you just lost. <laughs> yeah, you, you can't, you can't do it. Uh, you know, some, some midwits like, Oh, you can reach them. No, you can't. Not at any reasonable cost. You can't, they don't answer right. the phone. You can't telemarket them. Uh, may, maybe you could do direct mail, but at, at what cost and, and so on, you know, it, they're just, it's going to be very difficult to reach the people that you want at a reasonable marketing cost compared can, you know, considering what the ticket price is here. And, mm -hmm. You know, this is part of this is this is part of becoming a third world country. You know, people tend to think about, you know, third world countries in terms of um, services and infrastructure offered by the by the state. Mm -hmm. I mean, and we're there. I mean, the roads are terrible. The bridges are all seventy years old. You know, all the dams and electrical infrastructure was all built during the New Deal. Like we're we're there, but maybe more significantly is you can manufacture uh, 600,000 out of spec canning lids and nobody but Todd uh, calls in. Yeah, maybe those other people haven't opened their boxes yet. They just got them, they went sweet and then they put them back in their be. you know where they keep their canning supplies and they'll find out here in another month or two or three. Could be. Yeah. Or maybe they won't even notice and who cares. They look like, "Huh. I'm sure it's fine." I'll be darned. I don't know. They'll work. I'm in a pinch. I'll go ahead and go. So they'll they'll put up with it. Um, you know, so I, I find this over and over and over again. Um, so if you have a culture that will accept these kinds of things, you don't need right. nuclear power. No, you cannot make that mis You can't make one mistake ever. No, you can't. And not ever. just like this generation ever, ever, never. Nope. In 10,000 years, whoever is responsible for making sure that those containers that are full of the that still highly radioactive waste, that storage facility has to be flawless until the end of life on this planet. Oh. Or just before. 
Yeah, well, I suppose it would be just yeah, before. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so you, you can't have this pervasive permissiveness or slipshod um, way of life in nuclear power. Or how about this? Hmm. You've already played the Spice Police video. Mm -hmm. You can't have nuclear power in affirmative action. Well, no, you have to have, it only would work in a meritocracy. You have to have the finest people in the cosmos. Yeah, it doesn't matter who they even are. Think it about it. Yeah. To even think about it. Yeah. Yeah, the finest people without fail, regardless of what they look like or what sort of just pure. genitalia they're packing around or anything. doesn't matter. It's just pure talent. Everything ability. has to be perfection. You have yep. to shoot for perfection every single time. And not just shoot forever. For it. It's not like, oh, we have lofty goals. You get it, you get it wrong and the tri-state area dies. Yeah. Yep. And we can't make canning lids anymore. Right. Canning lids. Doesn't seem like a big ask. Oh God. And this is why these sorts of things are important. And, and why it's, it is important for all those, the little things that, you know, others say, wow, you're being a real crank about that. I mean, come on. It's true. You are. It is. Yeah, I am. And, <laughs> <laughs> but it is the crank that will keep a developed society from slipping into an undeveloped society. Well, there have to be those who are saying like, we can't do this. This is important. We maintain where we are at minimum all the time with an attempt to get better. And if that's not happening, then we're slipping and we can't slip because slipping means suffering for our children, our grandchildren and on down the line, or who knows what the planet around us, all the other creatures, all that sort of things. It's not, it's not a plan. So you, it's not a viable plan. Are a crank. But here's why. Mm -hmm. That's all your food. So if the can lids are messed up, you don't have any food. You don't have it in it's your. It's a budget. big deal. You don't have it in your budget to spend money to put that food up, have it not work, and then go get other food. No, the time and money lost on that. You, you I mean, know. that's, that represents, I don't, I don't even know how many hours each jar represents of labor and effort. It's yeah, it's terrible. So, you know, the, the stakes have just gone down for everybody. You know, you go mm -hmm. buy something at the grocery store and it's off. You just take it to the customer service desk and they're like, Oh, the customer's always right. And they credit you back or they'll tell you to go get another one and they give it to you. So mm -hmm. the stakes aren't that high. And, uh, you know, it just, people just by and by, they just like, they just don't care. And then they start to not even notice that they don't care. Mm -hmm. And, and then they, then they, uh, then they're setting up, then they're sending up all these shouts for, you know, clean nuclear energy. Well, the truth of it is you can't have that. Nope. Um, if it's possible to have, I'd argue maybe that it's not. But even if it's possible, then you have, we don't have a culture that would allow it. We don't have a culture that would support that. We don't. You know, you know how when you buy a new car, like even a Toyota, which is supposedly like really good, how they have recalls? Mm-hmm. Right. You can't have recalls when you have nuclear energy. You can't do it. Well, look what Boeing did a couple of years ago, the 737, when they knowingly had problems and they paid out, I don't even remember how many billions of dollars in fines over that one in lawsuits when they had a couple of planes uh, or planes that they had manufactured went down in short order. Yep. It's like, eh, like it's commercial aircraft. It's a big deal. You know, space flight. Yeah. That, ro that last rocket that went up didn't go very well for instance. So yeah, you can't make mistakes. Yeah. So Why would... good times. Yeah. I should finish the blanching and freezing thing. I love these loops oh. like that. Yeah. Well, cause this is, there's an important one for just like across the board too. The things you're going to freeze things to consider freezing versus things to can and how to do it. Mm. Freezing leafy greens. Um, so all the hearty cooking greens, um, kale chard, uh, collard, um, P 
peas, shelling peas, you're going to treat the same way. Salted water, cool. Put them on a sheet pan. Here's a little trick. Put them on a sheet pan with parchment also, one layer deep once they are dry. Uh, then they go into the freezer and freeze them so they freeze individually. And Ooh. then when they're frozen, you can put pour the whole thing into a bowl and just break them up really quick so they're all individual and put them into half-gallon mason jars. So now you're storing in glass. And then if you already have a vacuum packer, vacuum pack those suckers in there too and put them in the back of your freezer and they will be perfect. They will be perfect. Blanch them. You don't want to lose the boil when you blanch. Oh, that's the other thing. For volume of plant material you put in there, you don't want to put so much that you just like fill the pot up and it takes five minutes for the water to come back to a boil. You want to put enough in where the temperature just dips and then you come back up to boil as rapidly as possible. I know it seems more time consuming, but it's actually faster at the end of your process if you're doing smaller batches. So work in small batches. Um, and green beans are the last one you can do that with too. Don't blanch them for more than a minute because um, they'll get mushy and then their skin will peel off later and then no one wants to eat them. Even little kids don't want to eat them at that point. Um, and again, hot, salty water, cold, sheet pan, individual, into jars, vacuum that jar, throw it in your freezer. You vacuum yes. and berries do the, the same. Jar. I do. Yeah. Yeah. The vacuum sealer attachment in a jar, everything that I put in a jar, um, dried fruit, um, flint corn, my, my beloved Abenaki Calais. Um, and I don't put that in the freezer, um, in, uh, uh, dehydrated fruit. I don't put in the freezer, but I do vacuum seal all of them. Hey, and guys. the difference in preservation is extraordinary. Hey guys, look at Todd's face. Look at, look, look at it. Look at Todd's face. Look at his face. Not bad, huh? What do you freeze dry? What are you doing? What do I? <gasps> you. <laughs> you set me up. <laughs> Nothing. I don't freeze dry anything. Freeze drying. Stupid. <laughs> it's gross. Just saying. That's what people say. It's, <laughs> it's gross. Saying. And it takes this giant expensive machine. They're at all the, out. you know, you go into your, big box outdoor store or farm stores. Now you see those things sitting out there for three, four, five hundred dollars No, no, no you're kind of energy. They're a thousand dollars plus man. Oh, they're a thousand. Oh, yeah, yeah, I thought are. I saw like a $400 price tag on one. No, but the chamber's tiny too. I was like, what do you suppose you can process a pint of something at a time? Mm. Yeah. Freeze dried is good. If you're on, if you're on a mountaineering expedition, if you are trying to uh, ski across Antarctica, sure. Yeah. Freeze dried food makes a whole lot of sense, but as far as just a way to preserve food, bleh, I'm really curious nutritionally what it does too. I know it kills the flavor and that's, that's an abomination. Mm. So uh, don't do it. There are other ways of doing it there that are, you know, older ways of doing it and less energy intensive ways and the flavor and the, the quality remains. So do that. What else do we freeze this time of year? Berries. Oh yeah. Berries. Mm. Same thing. Don't blanch those. Clean them, dry them. Again, sheet pan and parchment paper. Um, I keep saying parchment paper because then it won't stick to your aluminum sheet pan. And by sheet pan, I mean cookie sheet, but not the flat style. And uh, if you have Teflon cookie sheets, throw those out. They're killing you. Um, and they're certainly messing with your endocrine system. Um, so sheet pan also, if you don't want to be sitting on aluminum, I don't like that because acidic things will react with it. But I use parchment on there. Put the berries on there separately, freeze them, and then when they're frozen, you can put them all into a bowl, break them off, and then pour them again into a half-gallon mason vacuum packet into the freezer. And then you can keep your strawberries and your blueberries and your currants and your raspberries and whatever else, your whatever other berries you have, and keep them for a long time. And then you can make jam in the winter mm. instead of in the summer when it's hot, and you don't want to cook jam and stand over a boiling pot of fruit puree when it's 100 degrees outside. Where can people find you, Todd? They can find me at uh, they can find me in my shop right now. <laughs> they can find me at growing <laughs> growingresilience.co is my website. Uh, gr.permaculture at gmail.com is my email. And the show is grpodcast at tutanota.com. T-U-T-A-N-O-T-A. And go to my website. Um, I Beyond farming, I also uh, teach people how to grow their own food, help them out, um, backyard gardens, homesteads. I help people design places. Um, I've done things from 
suburban backyards to helping people that are building their own Shangri-Las. Like, what do I do? How do I start? How do I put this together? Um, and giving them as much or as little as they want. Um, some people just want enough to get them off the ground and feel confident. And other people say, I really want you to design this whole thing for me and I'll do whatever you like. I have one fellow right now. This is a, this is a good story. He, um, he's very motivated. He's a, just a delightful person and uh he and his family are have a new newish property to them and um they're starting to build it up and he's just trying to get a fence put up and uh he uh he is discovering that uh, his response was everything costs a million dollars yep um nobody wants to work uh, he is from this area. I mean, we've spoken about this before. You move into a new area and you're obviously not from that part of the world. You might be difficult for you to find local folks to help you out, um, even when you're paying them. Yep. Um, but this guy is from that area. He sounds like he's from that area and he still can't get people to call. Like, they won't even call him back. He can't find people to job. And this is, you know, a, a not an exorbitant property. It's not just a backyard, but it's, you know, it's, it's more than a couple of acres and putting a fence up, nothing, just crickets from whoever he's trying to get a hold of. Uh, yep. Yeah. yeah. It's tough. It's really tough. And this is that third world thing we were talking about things like that. that start slipping services slip. People don't want to put in effort. So, yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. Output. You got to keep putting in effort. You know what, though? For all of us that are putting effort, there you go. We will be the ones on top of the New Holland uh, battle tractor someday. Mm -hmm. We'll be the uh, the ones who are putting in effort now. Hmm. I hope that's right. Maybe. Seems right. Maybe. Might not be. I don't know. What do I know? Um, what we're going to talk about next week is uh, about how you got started in market gardening and how you found your markets and uh, mm. what that, what that first year was like. <laughs> that sounds good. I'm glad it's not that first year again right now. Yeah. That's what we're going to talk about. It's moving. All right. That sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds really good. It'd be good for me to go back and revisit those, uh, the early days too. And um, then I'll give a report on my pickles and uh, tomato sauce and all that stuff. Tomato sauce? No, I'm not. I'm not in some. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not in some. I just want to mess with you. <laughs> Don't do that to me, Scott. Yeah. Tomato sauce. My tomatoes are four inches tall right now. Man, I don't I'm... even have my tomato bed ready. Yeah, mine are mine are coming along, and I'm going to start. Um... I don't know. I bet, I bet like Monday, I bet Monday I'll put their first clip on them. Oh, that's exciting. Oh, you don't, when you put them in the ground, you don't uh, trellis them right away. I, I didn't have my, I didn't have my tight wire up. Oh, that'll do it. You know? So, uh, did you stake them? Nope. Oh, you just stuck them in the ground. They're just hanging out all on their lungs. Oh, well, they're, no they're eight inches tall, you know? Well, yeah, but it, the, I, from what I understand, the wind blows in Oklahoma. Listen, if they can't, if they're not going to fucking make it, they're not going to make I it. I like it. I mean, they're I not, like you know, uh, I lost a few, you know, they, sure. uh, they break off at the ground or they get damaged at the ground. You know, I, I did lose a few and I replanted them and they'll be okay. Um, where they are, um, they're pretty safe from the wind. They don't get blown around too bad where they are. Okay. Uh, but, um, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be clipping those things up. I'll be clipping those things up here. And, um, uh, yeah, start training them. I'm excited about that. What kind of clips are you using? Are you using the Johnny's, uh, plastic? No, they cost clips? $12 trillion. Fuck no. Are you using the more expensive biodegradable Johnny's, uh, not plastic clips? No, I'm using one that has a little, they're, they're kind of round. They've got a little metal round spring, springy looking thing on them. Huh. Okay. Uh, uh, let me look. Let me see if I can find a picture of one. I'll show you. Metal, huh? I like that. Yeah, that's metal. They should be reusable. Yeah, it's the, these guys here. 
Let me see. I didn't, I, I didn't. I didn't order them from this place, you Ewans. I didn't order them from here. Let's see here. Let me hide my hide my toolbar, and then I'll show it. Yeah, it's like this. Ah, now will that hold on to a trellis line? Supposed to, because they've got that clipped on a stake. So the little that's that smaller indentation, yeah, right there, yeah. Yeah, they they should. Huh. Ooh, three dollars a piece. No, no, no. That's for like twenty. Oh. Yeah, they come. Oh, look, they come in different sizes. I bought the tiny ones. Mm hmm. Yeah. They'll, mm, okay. They should grip that. I bought a box of. I bought them from Nolts, as I do. Let me look. Mm. Let me see how much they were. They should be, re they're reusable. Um, I have a friend that owns a pot farm and he uses them. Uh huh. And they reuse them and reuse them and reuse them. He uses the bigger ones. But he, I am uh, discovering, I use the, the clear plastic ones that are a uh, high density polyethylene. They're sort of the industry standard for, uh, for trellising. Yeah. They might be better in a greenhouse. I've never grown tomatoes in a greenhouse. Um, I only grow outside and uh, they hate UV radiation. And I have got, ones. pardon? You have to buy the black ones. The the black ones. Yeah. Buy the black ones from, buy, buy the black ones from uh, Nolts. Why is that? The black pigment in them is a UV stabilizer. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. because the other ones the clear ones you only get a single season out and they get really brittle and they break and then they also uh it makes a darn mess in the garden and you have to pick the damn things up and there's plastic scattered everywhere right and uh i ain't got time for that oh there we go no i don't have time for that and what's also just like the idea is dumb yeah there they're the go. black ones the black ones right there all right yeah that's the vine clip that that's the style that i use in there okay seventeen dollars per thousand Oh, that's cheap. Dude, you've got to start using Nolts. I'm telling you. I mean, you okay. can't use them for everything, but if they've got it, their service is great. They're nice folks, family-owned thing. Their prices are good. If they've got it, it's, yeah. Yeah, some companies have gotten pretty crazy with their prices over the last few years, and I get it. You know, there, there are many factors that can cause that, but sometimes I feel like it might be a little beyond what needs to be the case loaded tomato twine hooks i know you use roller hooks mm -hmm. i'm not trying to talk you out of that a case of 420 of the the hooks mm -hmm. loaded 113 dollars they're fucking 27 cents a piece todd how do they manufacture those and, and sell them and then all the from every step that, and all the material that goes into it how do they do that i have it's no like magic idea huh yeah. well luckily i don't need more i have about three thousand roller hooks and uh they're all in use but boy howdy i as i'm cleaning i finally got the tomato block cleaned up but now i'm trying to pick all the bits of plastic out of the ground and then start getting the beds ready which is stupid i'm on my hands and knees crawling around picking up little tiny bits of broken uh like oh it's recyclable like sure but it doesn't do me any good when the bloody thing is you know a centimeter square and i have to go scratching through the dirt to find it they also make the biodegradable ones um which i'm much more a fan of those working does notes have biodegradable ones where i'm going the biodegradable though is you then have to cut you have to take all the nylon twine off your roller hook and replace it with a uh, cecil or jute right. um and then you can just cut the whole thing off and then compost it all. And that's a really good idea because it saves a huge amount of labor. When you're growing 150 tomatoes uh, every year that are getting pulled down, it's a lot of labor to put the system together, maintain the plants all year, and then disassemble it at the end of the year. It just doesn't happen. And I don't want to just like have a half biological, half synthetic mess. Then, then I take these tomato plants which were my little plant buddies all summer long and take them to the dump seems an ignominious end that i'm not comfortable with uh, so white trellis netting white trellis netting 
Uh-huh. What's that normal brand everybody talks about? I don't know. I make my own trellis. Oh, come on, Todd. I do. They're, those trellis nets made out of monofilament or it's made out of nylon of some sort. Made out of nylon. I can't do anything with it. I have it. Then it's again like a whole a whole bunch of damn garbage mixed in with these plants that I spend all this time and effort to make them as clean and pure and perfect as possible that they can be. Then I have to throw the whole mess away. Nah. Well, I make my own. Uh, go ahead. For, cer for certain things, you can reuse that that netting over and over again. Uh, beans, you're going to be able to, like Connor Craigmore plants beans back on that netting over and over and over again. Um, I, I, I wouldn't do it with tomatoes. I, there's a lot of stuff. Out. Hordenova. Hordenova is the brand you normally okay. see. Get this. 48 inches tall, 328 feet long. Uh huh. $58. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense at all. Um, uh, the, the, here's, here's one that's interesting, uh, that almost made me just do a, just do an experiment just to see what was going on. I got to take my, uh, thing off. Here we go. Look at here. Greenhouse, ugh, tomato trellis. Wow. See ah. that? The hook under there, the the thing. Uh -huh. Look at that. Ah, it's it's wire. You hook it over your top wire. What do you care? Right, you it over your top wire. You move on with your life. Ninety eight inches long. Mm -hmm. Eight dollars and sixty cents a piece. And you're going to use that forever. You're going to use it forever. Yeah, well, thousand bucks up front for me, but then uh, and you have to store them. But you don't have to replace it. That's pretty nice. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I thought about doing it. But it's also, it's a straight line. Yeah. Tomatoes don't grow like that. The plant doesn't have to be a straight line. Just because it's support is, the string's going to be straight by the time you put a load on it. Yeah, but I angle them from, I have a couple strings because I do two liters on all my tomatoes and they come in from different angles. And then it shifts depending on which way the plant is growing. What was that? Two, two liters, belt and suspenders. Exactly. <laughs> I found two works out better. It's a lot more uh, work to to grow them, I think. Well, I'm sure it is. I mean, it's twice as much work because I have to prune twice as many liters. But uh, growing outside, disaster strikes pretty regularly. And, uh, you know, if you lose you lose a liter on a tomato, if you've been really fastidious and you're pruning up till then, it takes a long time for a new leader to establish and sometimes they won't. So I always keep two. Yeah. I should tell you about my pea trellising too, because this is a pretty good one. Um, I use T posts, metal T posts. I actually, I just did it all yesterday. Uh, they finally got tall enough. A 50 foot row has six T posts, one at either end, four in the middle. They're what, nine and a half feet apart, I think. Um, and I use a uh, Cecil twine, just buy the big, like 2,500 foot roll at a time. Cause it's as cheap as it gets and go down, do one loop around each T post, all the, the nubs face all in the same direction. Right. Um, and that's what keeps the line from sliding down. I do a single loop and then keep going and then a single loop and keep going till I get to the other end. It's tied off at the ends. It has a single loop that you pull tight in between each one. I do the first one, two nubs off the ground, and then I skip a nub for each layer beyond that, which I think works out to about three inches. And um, it's quick. And I mean, it's not as quick and easy as putting up that, the netting, the, the monofilament trellis, but um, at the end of the year, when peas are done, well, not the end of the year, at the end of pea season, take a knife blade, put it in the, uh, inside the angle on the T post and slide the blade straight down and it cuts all that, uh, sea sole right off. And then I go along the base and if I'm feeling really fancy, I might use a weed whacker or a scythe and cut them all off. Actually, I, sorry, I cut them off before I cut them off the trellis or a comma which is like a little hand scythe and you just crawl around and cut everyone off at soil level. So you leave the roots in the ground and then cut all the sea salt, everything falls into a pile. And then you can actually start at one end and roll the whole thing up and then throw it in a wheelbarrow and then go drop it over in your compost pile. Cleanup is done. It's really slick. Um, I don't have to clean anything up. I don't have to store anything. That's how I did cucumbers last year. Oh, how'd that go? 
fine. Yeah, cool. Fine. Um, they were a little more. They were more chaotic than I wanted them to be. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm going to be using roller hooks on the cucumbers this year. And I don't know. Yeah, I use roller hooks on the cucumbers. I <laughs> like the idea though. I don't know if the seeds will be. I would be worried about the weight of the cucumbers because the peas don't. They don't get tall enough that they don't. You know, they're only like four feet tall at maximum height, and that they're not is. in the ground for very long. And they don't get. But those cucumbers get heavy, man. And they were they, you know, they're seven feet tall. Yeah. I think I broke some strings, you know. Right, and that's a they problem. Did fine. They did fine. We made plenty and whatever, but I'm going to use roller hooks. And I'm, I'm probably going to have to lower in lean, right, even though I'm outside. I mean, I don't have, uh, right? I don't have, uh, long, I don't have a nine-foot-long trellis for those things. Yeah, I do mine seven feet high so I can walk underneath them. Um, and then you can use a 10-foot T-post. And, yeah, you can lower... You don't have to lean as much on the, the cucumbers because there's just a much softer vine. It isn't like the tomato really stiffen at the base. Um, so you can almost drop them down and coil themselves. Uh, often, just also the length of my season, you're going to probably get more growth because of where you are, um, unless the heat shuts them down. But around here, if mine hit 10 feet by the end of the season, that was a good run for a single plant. So I'll just double them back over. I'll hang it over the top and I'll hang it on the west side. So that part will get the most evening sun because it starts losing. I'll start losing Eastern light before I lose Western light. That's how I make up for it. And honestly, I don't like piling them on, on the ground after those run-ins last year, a couple of rattlesnakes. I want to keep that open, open, open. I'm not, that was, that was too close after touching that one when I was picking. I don't, I, I, I don't want that again. Nope. <laughs> no good. Nobody wants that noise. How long do your, do your cucumber plants get? Ish. They may go to the, they may go to, uh, they may go all the way to frost. They get, they tend to peter out, you know, it's a heavy feeder, you know, but if you sure. keep pouring them to them, they'll be okay for a long time. You know, it'll keep going and going and going. But could you get like a 20 foot vine? I for can't, instance? I can't, I've never even tried. I, I don't know. I can't imagine. Okay. Could be. I don't know. <sighs> hey, that's enough of that shit. <laughs> we got stuff to do in the gardens. Hey, um, oh my God, do I? Man, my grapes look so good. Mm, They're cool. just covered with clusters. They're flowering right now. You know, those weird little grape flowers, little alien looking thing. Uh, mm. Man, they're just covered. I'm going to have to thin those things out. The Peaches are about the size of a somewhere between a jack ball and a golf ball. They're getting there. Uh, blackberries are blooming. Um, propagations. I've been potting up stuff. Potting up. Potting up. Potting up. Um, I put. I, I've. St I've started putting together. Um, I've. I've started putting together a. Um, I don't even know what you would call it. An exemplar garden. I don't know. Hmm. Uh, uh, right, your your library garden or your mother garden, mother yeah, plant so garden. Yeah, doing cuttings from that. Um, been working on that. It's exciting. Um, a lot of fun, a lot of fun right now. Cool. Garden looks good. You know, I don't know. Good fun. Did, did I tell you I got my raspberries in the ground? Yeah, that's a positive story. Thirty of them. Uh, and this, I'll mention this company because they were great. Burnt Ridge Nursery. In uh, somewhere in Washington, on the west side of the state, uh, Polana raspberries, and they were grown and shipped by people that obviously understand plants, and it was really appreciated. They were healthy, they were consistent, they had huge root systems, big healthy root systems properly packaged they were wrapped in wet paper or in, in a wet newspaper they used a piece of bamboo to stiffen the inside of the box so it wouldn't get bent during shipping and wouldn't get knocked off so they reinforced the package inside which was very clever um, they were packed tight but not damaging tight um, yeah everything about them was was great and they were when i took them all apart uh, everything looked really, really good. I cared for them before I put them into the ground, soaked them right away to get the roots rehydrated. Um, and, but they're already in good shape and they planted up really well. And, um, I have 
very high hopes for them. As it turns out, I even had two extras because I got extra thinking that I might have some uh, mortality. So I'm going to pot those two remaining ones up and either use them to take cuttings from, or if I do lose any that I did put out, I can replace them. But uh, yeah, that was, that was real joy to get such healthy plants after I had some a rough start from another, uh, a different nursery, not that one, but Burnt Ridge really did me right. So thank you. If any of you folks from Burnt Ridge are listening, I really appreciate it. Uh, so where there. can they find you, man? Again, they can find me at growingresilience.co or email me at gr.permaculture at gmail.com. Man, that is wonderful. And that is it. I have zero social media presence and I won't have it. So there. Uh, yeah, you can't find me. I don't know. <laughs> Follow me on Twitter. I'm always posting inflammatory shit on Twitter. Ham at Hambrick Scott. <laughs> funny there. Uh, and it is to, fun to be provocative, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's always good. And go to the Turnpike Tributors website and pre-order their new album that comes out August 25th. Ah, uh -huh. I'm very excited. I'm scared too. What that it's not going to be as good as you're hoping? High expectations, you know. They've done a lot of good work in the past. You should have high expectations. They have, they have earned a, the uh, the fear of high expectations. Yeah, uh, the album's called "A Cat in the Rain." Very excited. I get a single out. Eh, I don't love it. Hmm. But you know, it's okay. Maybe That's it's okay. because you're a crank. Yeah, that 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 could definitely be. Uh, hmm. But I'll, I'll be seeing them in prior. In the in mid September, very excited about that. The, at the Born and mm -hmm. Raised Music Festival in Pryor, Oklahoma. I told you about that, didn't I? You did tell me about that. It's very oh exciting. God. It's quite a, quite a lineup of artists that they have showing up. Yeah, it's going to be crazy. Um, everybody that everybody that I care about is going to be there. Um, yeah, good fun. Cost. Uh, I think we paid seven or eight million dollars to go, but uh, but flat that's money well spent. Yeah, Flatland Cavalry is going to be there. Jamie Lynn Wilson, Jamie, Jason Boland, all the people. Uh, Randy, huh? Randy Rogers Band, all the people I want to see. Caitlin Butts, hmm? Mike and the Moon Pies, huh? I I don't know who Caitlin Butts is. That the name is fantastic though for a country singer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Caitlin's. Yep, yep, yep. Ah, well, anyway, there's all that. Uh, next week, we'll talk about Todd getting his start in market gardening. I'm sure there are a lot of people that are interested in doing that, and. Uh, um, uh, we will de-romanticize all that bullshit. <laughs> I might romanticize a little bit of it. Oh, okay. <laughs> and uh, hey, thank you guys so much for listening. Pass it on to somebody who might enjoy it. And uh, thanks for listening to our ramblings. I appreciate you guys letting us into your ear holes every week. It's a big deal. It really is. Thank you. Talk to you in a week. Take care.